Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Good evening. I am really looking forward to speaking tonight. And I don't normally say that because normally you're a little bit um, nervous and apprehensive about what you're going to say. But um, I'm just so glad that you're all here and that we're all here because um, I've had a really long week. A lot of it's been on my own, working, doing the hard work. So I'm very grateful to be here with you people tonight. And all I was thinking about today was how lovely that we have such a great team. I love team. Part of what I'm going to bring tonight is um, when I spoke last time, I said that um, Chris had given me her notes because she lost her voice, if you remember. And I said we might bring the rest of them later. And I've not stolen them from her. She's given me permission <laughs> to use them. Um, but I really, really love team, so I'm very grateful for her notes today, and I'm very grateful for you all to be here. And what I am going to say tonight has helped me this week when I've... Um, you know when you've just had one of those weeks where there's been a lot of things going on? I've been involved with a project at work. Um, not my project, but a project I've been helping with. And it's almost like, you know when the things that were happening, you think you couldn't write it. Have you ever had one of those weeks? So you're in the middle of a pressured moment, the deadline's looming, you're, you're in this ho we're in this hotel in Newcastle that was all really pressured, really intense, we're watching the clock. Um, and just... The scanner broke, and then something else happened, and then the photocopier was too slow, and then on another day, when my colleague was trying to finish it, the fire alarm went off. Have you ever had one of those? Well, you just think, it's not meant to be. And all I've been thinking this week in reaction to my week is I've just been thinking, oh, no, not something else. Oh, no, not something else. And so I want to speak to you tonight about yes, about yes. Because what I've discovered this week is how there's a way even in the midst of your nose to say yes. And so I'm hoping it's going to do you good. And of course, it has been a very historic week. I am not going to get into politics, but we're certainly in a moment of history, aren't we? And what struck me and I suppose inspired me to talk about this today is yesterday, um, I mean, there was all sorts being said about it, wasn't it? I, I kind of looked at some stuff for a bit and then it annoyed me, so I just stopped looking. But I heard, um, I heard someone say, yesterday, very wisely actually, he said, so many people, um, it wasn't a vote that says, yes, we want to leave. It was a vote that said, no, to staying. Now, you might think, but that's the same thing. But a protest vote is not the same as a positive vote. And you'll have seen this stuff on the news. Um, and I think tonight that it's very, very important that we ask ourselves, um, what am I saying yes to in my life? Because there might be so many things that you're saying no about in your life, but what are you saying yes to for your life? And you might think, well, Jenny, it's just the same thing. And I'm going to tell you, no, I don't think it is. Now, one thing I often refer to that I heard Ant speak about years ago, and it is one of those things that comes to my mind again and again and again, and I've probably mentioned it multiple times. He talked about the story where Jesus is out on the water with his disciples, and they have caught nothing. They are fishermen. They are expert fishermen. It is their job. They know how to do it. They have caught nothing. And his advice to them is, throw your net on the other side of the boat. And I've said this to you before, but I'm saying it again because it's brilliant. Why would it make a difference from the width of a boat, from there to however wide the boat is, why is that going to make a difference in an ocean? It is a minuscule distance, but yet when they threw their net over the other side of the boat, all of a sudden their nets got filled. And there's something in that principle for me that still works in 2016, that sometimes a shift that can physically seem so small when it is based on a revelation and something that comes within us can make an almighty difference to the outcomes in our life. And I'm asking you today in some areas of your life to shift from a no to a yes and to somehow believe that there's a supernatural element in that that will bring a different outcome to your life. 
Now, for me, the boat is the same in that story, the passengers are the same, the sea is the same, the nets are the same, the surroundings are the same, the only difference is whether they're going to say yes to a different possibility. And Jesus was saying, will you say yes to my instruction despite the fact that my instruction seems to you so... What, what difference will it make? He was asking them for a yes. For a yes to the possibility that the last word has not yet been spoken. This is our year of hope that has been spoken over us. Um, we are in a year of hope. We're nearly halfway through a year of hope because the year of hope says we are confident that the last word has not yet been spoken and that there will be another word after that. So there is not a no in every area of your life because it's a year of hope. There's another word to follow after this. Now, I think a no or a yes is a real attitude thing, isn't it? You know, it's a real perspective that we take on life. One says no, the other says yes, and that yes is always full of hope. Now, I've, I've been able to reflect today, and I've been thinking, I don't mind anybody having a no, because we, of course, have to have some no's in life. I'm, of course we do. I'm not stupid. I don't mind having people having a no, and I don't mind people choosing to say no to things or places or jobs or whatever you need to say no to. I've actually called my preach tonight, how to leave and how to say no. That's what came to me. And I don't mind people choosing to leave things. When it is about a great yes in response to something that they're going to embrace that is worth having. When it's a protest no in life, I really struggle because just like I've seen over the last couple of days, the consequence for some people of realizing, oh, I only voted no in protest. I didn't really mean no. It, 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 well, it, it brings all kinds of complications and it sets us on a trajectory. There is now a direction we are going as a result of that. Now, just turn them. I think how we hear no and say no is highly significant. And this is not a negative message. In fact, it's actually quite the opposite because I want to leave you and keep asking you, what are you saying yes to in your life? At this time in your life, what are you saying yes to in a very um, real and conscious way? Now, we have talked a lot in this place about deconstructing some of the common messages that we have perhaps been handed down for those of you who've been raised in a sort of traditional version of Christianity. Some of you haven't, but for some of us, that's been quite a journey to go. And I've heard countless times people say, oh, we don't think that anymore. We don't believe that anymore. We don't say that anymore. And almost like we know what we don't think. We know what we've said no to. Um, but can you articulate yet what we have said yes to, because the story of the rock is not us saying no, it's actually us saying an almighty yes, because what we've understood is, hang on a minute, there's more to this, there's more that we could be seeing in this, there's more that we could be pursuing, and, and one example of that is we've had some teaching recently, and there'll be more coming when Ant gets back, about the, the cross and what it's all about. Now, some of you have been raised that the cross um, represents um, certain things that have been perhaps... Met, you've been questioning, well, where does that fit? What does that mean for us now? But we haven't said no. No one has said no to the idea of the significance of the cross. Nobody has said no to that. What we've done is said yes to saying, right, hang on a minute, have we got the full story on what that's all about? Is it this thing that was needed to make God love us? Or is it actually something that screams so much louder about how much we have always been loved and that goes way beyond? It's actually got a yes attached to it because we're, we're embracing something bigger. Now, I want to go back to where we, we left last time. We were talking about some things in Matthew 5, um, which is interesting because I kept thinking about that verse that says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And that happens to be in Matthew 5. Hmm, interesting. So that's at the start of Matthew 5 because Jesus says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Now, people in his day made oaths 
They made promises, and then they broke those oaths depending on what they had sworn on. Because in the Old Testament, there was a, a law that said, if you swore in God's name, and then you broke that, because you needed a deity, a God, to witness it, if you then broke that oath, it was actually very dangerous for you, um, because it was a massive, massive big deal. So what people would do is, instead of swearing on by God, they would swear on an object because they'd be like, well, I'll swear on this water bottle because then that means if I don't quite keep it, I'm not cursed because I'm not sworn in God's name. So what they were messing with, they were basically messing with it, weren't they? They were living just within the law, but they weren't really intending to... The intent of their heart was some small print so that if they needed to say no later on, they could do it. And what he was getting at was saying, look, it doesn't matter what you're thinking about the laws. It's not about that. It's about what is the intent and the integrity of your heart. And his own point was not so much that oaths are evil, but what is our motivation for engaging with them that we should actually tell the truth, that we should actually be people that when we say yes to something, we mean yes, and that we're going to do it. And when we say no to something, that there's an integrity about the decisions that we are making. Now, this has real, real implications to me in life because last time we talked about how we were going to go the extra mile and turn the other cheek and forgive 70 times 7. That's enormous because it means that somehow or other we've got to forgo our rights to what we think we might be entitled to. Um, and you might have lots of things that you think you have a right to in life, um, a right to respect, a right to not have to work overtime, a right to being treated a certain way as a result of what you've invested. Um, but whether we say yes or no has to be determined by an integrity that stretches beyond the contract of law to really get what the way of life is that Jesus is talking about. He was saying that our yes and our no doesn't come down to being points of law, it comes down to being an intent and an attitude of our heart. And that way of life, of course, has got to be a way of love. So we're never a protest vote against, but always a desire to expand and to be loving. So our no should always be about within a context of saying yes to a way of love. Do you hear me? Yes? So there's a way to say no that is about saying yes to love. And there's a way to say no that is just a protest because your rights aren't being met. Now, protest embraces that old adage that says, if you do something badly enough, you'll never be asked to do it again. <laughs> well, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it because I have to do it. But I'm not going to do a very good job of it. And I'm only going to do it because I have to. We've never been there, have we? We never act like that. So we're actually doing it. But we're not doing an it with an attitude of, yes, I'm in this and I'm embracing it. Now, what about it fits unreasonable? and surely beyond what we should be expected to do. Now, this whole second mile stuff, this whole Matthew 5 chapter is incredibly challenging. And you might think, well, it's 2016. What has it got to do with us? We have embraced a way of life in this place. And we've said part of what we're going to do is follow the way of life that is exemplified in the man called Jesus. Now, is he the entire story of God? No, God's huge, God's massive, but there is a way of life that he lived by that we could be inspired to follow that way of life. And to me, it's about that width of a boat. Somehow or other, he managed to master a way of living that kept him connected with the Father and able to invest himself full of grace and truth into everyone he met in society. I don't think that's a bad pattern to follow for my life or aspire to. Now, he said this, um, go the second mile. He talked about going the extra mile. If someone asks you to go one mile, go with them too. Now, in Jesus' day, it was referring to the fact that Roman soldiers had the authority to force civilians to carry their loads for one mile. They could just come up and say, Oi, you, carry my stuff. Just like that. Now, Roman law said that the person only had to do this service for one mile, and then he was free to go. Now, obviously, you're not going to want to do more than a mile, are you? Someone's forcing you to take something heavy that you think, well, it's not my thing to carry. Who do you think you are? So you do your mile, and then you walk away. Um, so they, they, obviously the Jews did the mile because they had to, and then they were off. 
They measured the steps, they measured the mile in steps, 1,000 exactly, and they counted every single step. And when they got to 1,000, they stopped, put down the pack, and left the Roman to carry his own load or find another victim. That was the law. Now, the Jews obviously hated the Romans, making them carry their stuff. How many of you hate when people make you carry their stuff? How hard is it when people put stuff on you that you think, that's not my stuff. I don't want to carry your stuff. Um, now, I could, you know, I mean, you can imagine, can't you, some slave saying, all right, I have to carry his stuff, but, you know, I'm not going to do it with enthusiasm. I'm not going to do it really well, and if it gets a bit muddy and I drop some stuff on the way or bash it about a bit, well, so be it, because you shouldn't be asking me to do it. Now, what Jesus says is, if that happens to you, go another mile. Go another mile. Yay. That's a good news message, isn't it? Yay. Um, he's saying, look, don't behave as if, you know, oh, if I have to. He's saying, give your opponent more than he has the right to demand. That's massive. Think of the thing that is being demanded of you most in this moment. And imagine being asked to do that for double the amount. That's what was being said. Are we happy with that? Yay. Um, now, I find it really challenging, but I also find it really inspiring because I, think, I don't think I would be asked to do that if there wasn't a way to do it. Because what he was saying was, right, you can either scream no at what is being demanded of you, or you can say yes to a way to handle what is being demanded of you that takes you beyond what you might actually be able to handle in your own strength. Um, despite dem It's saying this, demonstrate a humble servant's heart, cheerfully go beyond what is expected or demanded. So how are you doing with that? Are you embracing everything that's being thrown at you with a servant heart saying, yes, okay, Ooh, it's tough, but we're in it, we're going for it. Or are you screaming no in your life tonight? What if I was to tell you, those of you that are screaming no, that there is a great possibility in your life for a yes? What if I told you that in the width of a boat, there's another way of embracing a different outcome in your life by saying yes? Now, it's about a love without limits, because it talks about how we give to him who asks of us and do not turn away those who want to borrow from you. So this whole idea that we're going to give to whoever asks and not turning away anyone who wants to borrow, um, that had to do, that illustration had to do with the law of lending. So we're into banking. Excellent. Um, I found out today, actually, and this is interesting timing, my friend, um, who is also in the middle of this manic project with me, was due to have a loft conversion in a month. So um, she thought, that's fine, we'll get this big project out of the way. And this morning, um, the builders turned up with scaffolding <laughs> to put on her house. So she rings me going, eh, <laughs> seem to be having a my loft conversion today. So they've turned up a month early. The challenge is she hasn't got the money yet because she's waiting for her accounts to go through and them to release some money to her off the mortgage. So her and her husband decided, oh, it's all right, but let's not worry about it. We've got a good credit rating. Let's just take our credit rating into the bank um, and the bank will say, well, fine, you know, you've got a brilliant credit rating, so have you. So they put, you do that thing, don't you, on, online where you work out your credit score. And when my friend put in her credit score, hers was like red, 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 red. And apparently, there's a 200 quid credit card she hasn't paid in 2011 that she doesn't even know she'd had. So all of a sudden, she's got the builders with scaffolding and no money to pay for the builders with scaffolding, and the bank's not willing to lend her any money. Now, in that situation, she definitely wants the law of lending to work for her. What was it? Do not turn away anyone who wants to borrow from you. <laughs> Banks sometimes turn you away when they want to borrow from you. And what this was about was it was about an old law that said that debts were cancelled after seven years. Um, and the borrowers, of course, loved this because you could go in year six, borrow some money, sit on it. It's all wiped out. <laughs> by year seven. Brilliant. Now, of course, the lenders didn't like that because they're thinking, hang on, if you're borrowing from me in year six, month 10, <laughs> it's unlikely you're going to pay it back because a borrower came for a loan in the sixth year, was unlikely he's going to pay it back and the lender's not going to get his money. So, of course, the lender's going to think twice. 
The closer to the seventh year you got, the more tight-fisted lenders became. But Jesus said they were not to allow the seventh year to govern them. Whenever a person had a need, God's people were to give generously. Now we're back to that 70 times seven. The seven's always very important. And you think, what he's saying is we can't be governed by the likelihood that we're going to get it paid back. Ooh, I'm filling you with good news tonight. That what we decide to give cannot be on the basis of what we may or may not get in return. We give because we've said yes that we're going to give. We give because we're saying yes, and we're saying yes to an abundance in people's lives. Um, now, it wasn't about home improvement loans. It wasn't about their loft conversion. It was about them needing money for food. So it was to do with people needing legitimate ne with, with legitimate needs. Now, does that mean that bankers should never refuse a loan application, no matter what it looks like, or that we should just give out loads of money and be irresponsible? No, of course not, because we, we exercise discernment, don't we? And sometimes the no to lending money is because we've said yes to a way of loving that person's life. But you get the principle. It doesn't relieve you of your commandment. This commandment doesn't relieve you of your obligation to manage your resources responsibly, but it does ask you the question, is this a love without limits? Now, the first commitment we must make is to forgo your own rights. Hey. This is necessary because as a disciple, to some extent, so great extent, you have no rights, because we chose not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of right and wrong, of good and evil. We said we're going to go for life. How does the rights work when you go for life and you go for a 70 times 7 spirit? How does that work? It's going to have implications, isn't it? Um, if we are to live like Jesus and go this way, and carry on replicating that, you must go above and beyond a law, because a no... What some of you will hear when I say no rights will be bigger than my inspiration to you to say yes to something else. What do you mean I'm not allowed no rights? What do, you mean, what do you mean by that? We get to go beyond the rights and wrongs to life. It's not a negative, but the outworking is very effortful, and there's no denying that. But I genuinely think that the effort of carrying unforgiveness, resentment, and bitterness is one of the most exhausting ways you can live your life. It's exhausting to live like that. It's exhausting to see everything that's wrong with the world and wrong with people and carry around everything that's ever happened to you. Now, the second commitment is this. You ready for more good news? Yay! Basically, kill your enemies with kindness. Love your enemies. Yay, that's great news. Who wants to say yes to that? Um, now, not literally kill your enemies with kindness. Like, I really love you. Die. It's, it's not that. Um, now, that's massive. But does it take effort to love people who you love? Or does it take effort into saying yes to loving people who actually are a horrendous um, challenge to you sometimes? Now, Jesus says, you have heard that it is said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, neighbor conveys the idea of one who is near. So the neighbor could be a fellow believer, if you like, but I'm not just talking about believer as in a Christian, a pleasure. That's my association now with that word. Thank you. Um, a fellow believer. Think about in life we have fellow believers. I have fellow believers who don't believe in God because they share my worldview. Isn't it lovely when people share your worldview because they get it? So people, it's not about loving people that see the world how you, you see it. It's actually about loving people who might see the world very opposite to how you see it. Now, the crowd that was listening to Jesus' sermon must have thought to themselves, okay, well, I'll love them, them, and them. <laughs> But those over there, those Samaritans, as it were, was at the time, and the Gentiles, well, I can't quite make my love go that far. But so long as I do this bit here, we're actually all right. And Jesus once again goes above and beyond the law by declaring, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, that requires a supernatural strength. It does. And that's why I believe in that width of a boat. Why were there suddenly fish 
on the other side of the boat. Somehow or other, something kicked in. Something kicked in in response to an intent of their heart that says, I am going to say yes to a different opportunity, to a different way to do this. I am not for a single second suggesting that that's easy. I'm suggesting that it's a wisdom that will help you find a way through even those things in life that seem to be so against you. Now it says, it's been said, to return evil for good is devilish. To return good for good is human. To return good for evil is divine. Massive. Now, this is not about being friends with your attacker or abuser, because that would be unhealthy and dangerous, but we are commanded to love our enemy. It doesn't say you have to like your enemy or like what he does, but it's love. Love requires that you concern, are concerned about the welfare of even your enemies. This means that you will do things that will benefit and not harm you. Great, this stuff, in it? Um, I mean, do you have a word of hope for even your enemies, or is that the last word that's going to be spoken on their life? Can you believe for a word of hope, even for the things that seem to be working the most against you? Now, why should you do that? Jesus gives a great purpose in loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you. Persecute you. This is the reason. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Now, sons doesn't mean that if you do this, you'll be in. If you do this, you'll be my son. What it's saying is, you know that expression, like father, like son? He's talking about if we do that, we become an extension of everything he is. We become the equivalent we become the representatives. It's a way of carrying on the story. Right now, in 2016, we become the same as, and we get to outwork the same as. Now, even God does not withhold from anyone. God deals with his friends and his enemies alike, and he has faith always in a yes on a person's life. I don't think there's anybody in the whole world who God doesn't look at and think of something he could say, have a yes in their life. Somehow he's screaming yes at them. Somehow he's screaming yes and wanting them to embrace what he's saying yes to. Let me bring this to a close. Um, how is your love, Jesus talks about, going to surpass that of the tax collector? The tax collector was the most despised people in Jewish society. And he was talking about how we've got to go beyond... I've missed a bit out. One second. I do so well, and then I get to the end, and it's like, oh, I get like, oh, I can relax now. I'm nearly there, and then I lose my place. Is there something about your love that cannot be explained in human, natural terms? Does your love extend beyond you? Are you your source of your love? Or is it possible to tap into something else? Do you stop being kind and gracious to others because you know that they dislike you? How far does your love actually reach? And if we're going to do something really incredible in this place and in this city, are we going to have a love that goes beyond, way beyond everything that could be explained naturally? Jesus concludes that passage in Matthew 5 by saying, Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. <laughs> now, that can't mean flawless. Even God looks at the world at the beginning and says the world's good. It's more like perfect, as in it fits the purpose for what it's made. My kettle is perfect for boiling water. I know what my husband's thinking. He's thinking the, the button's broken on my kettle. Why didn't you pick something that's functioning in the house? <laughs> my kettle is not perfect, but normally when the button's not broken, it's perfect. Are, are we, are we per fit for a purpose of bringing a word of love and hope to the people in our lives? Are we fitting that purpose or have we got more yes than no's? Is it a love without limit? Now, a 70 by 7 spirit is a yes spirit. It's a spirit that says yes to a word of hope on everybody. And it says yes again and again and again and again. And there are some no's within the process, no doubt. Of course there are. But the overwhelming, the overwhelming response is a yes on people's lives. And, and I want us to be people that bestow a yes on each other. A yes on everyone we meet, that our first thought is yes. 
about somebody and what their possibility is. And let's all be very wary of having a protest vote in our life, a no or an exiting in our life that is just a response to what we hate and dislike rather than it is a yes to what we're going to embrace and walk in. Now, I could get into tonight where our no's come from because they come from places of injury and brokenness and life experience. And I understand absolutely all of those. But I think for me, what's the absolute great wisdom for me and all that I've understood today is that we can throw the net on the other side of the boat. And that isn't something that makes sense rationally. It's the same boat. It's the same water. It's the same circumstance. It looks the same, smells the same, feels the same. But when that word of hope comes into our life that says, will you cast your net on the other side of the boat? We've got to grab that opportunity and think, do you know what? Yeah, I'm going to believe for a different outcome in my life by making a shift in my life to say a yes to what's coming to me, not a no, get me out of this. Um, there is provision for you and yours tonight for a supernatural encounter when we make a shift from yes, from no to yes. I really do believe that. And there's an involvement beyond yourself. It says, doesn't it, that all of God's promises are yes and amen. And I think he always finds a yes. So I don't know where you are at tonight, but I know that this is going to help some of you. I know that it's going to help all of you. Um, what are you saying yes to in your life today? What's what are you saying yes to? Do you even know? Or do we just go on our merry way? I really want you to take time to reflect on what you're embracing. And I really want you to be very, very wary of having a vote in life that is based on a no. Always make choices based on a yes to something. It's a better way to decide stuff. So we're going to have a moment to give you a chance to connect with what I've said tonight because it's important for some of you to just consciously decide that you are going to move the width of a boat. If you are screaming no in your life about stuff that you are facing, I am absolutely convinced that you could get a word in your heart tonight or as you think about what I've said that will tell you what you can say yes to. And as you embrace that yes, it's going to bring you a different outcome, just like it did for those fishermen in that boat. Can't explain how it'll happen. Might look very similar, but it's going to set a different course in your life and in your circumstance. So we're going to pray together. If you know you need to be someone who is saying a yes, not a no in your life, I want to invite you to stand. I want you to invite you to go the width of the boat, and we're going to all pray together that you'll get a different outcome in your life. So... Let's pray. God, I want to thank you so much that something happens outside of our own source or control or understanding when we connect to what you have to say to us. And I believe tonight that there are people in here that can embrace a yes and see a different outcome in their life. And I just pray tonight that you will enable them to catch hold of something that they can say yes to that will give them a word of hope in their heart to embrace, to move forward, to bring a freedom and an outcome that seems to go beyond anything that they could have actually ever expected. And I'm trusting for that for them tonight. And for those of us who are saying no and who are in danger of saying a no that will set us on a trajectory that would be unhelpful, God, I pray you'll speak to their hearts right now, and I trust you to do that, that there'll be somehow a way to embrace a yes in life and to go on a path that is going to be an absolute way of love. Help us to be people who can go beyond um, in your strength and in your power and just keep us loving each other, keep us loving others, and just help us to have your spirit. Thank you. Amen. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support the Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.